Welcome to the Experienced Focus Leaders Podcast. I'm delighted to welcome Glenn Polos, co-founder and general manager of NWS, at formerly Gap Wireless, a leading distributor in mobile broadband wireless and test measurement equipment market. Glenn is the author of Never Sit in the Lobby, which is a handbook for sales and it combines years of experience in doing sales, complex sales um, in his life and career uh, into that book. And would love to learn more about uh, you know, the sales experience, founder experience, and how do you mix it all, Glenn? So welcome to the podcast. Hi, Alex. Thank you so much for having me today. It's great to be here. Great. Well, let's start with the book, Glenn. In, the, sure. in your book, Never Sit in the Lobby, uh, you offer top sales tactics and strategies from wealth of experience that you've had. You know, can you share us what are the top three nuggets that you would want somebody to uh, take away from the book and, and possibly drill in further? Sure. So when anyone asks me what the book is about, I usually say it. Uh, the book is sort of a handbook on how to get, act, and stay in front of your clients and mm -hmm. how to be a pleasure to do business mm. with always. Mm. And so, um, and you know, the sub, the subtext of the book, uh, never sit in the lobby, you know, 57 tips for building a career in a business in sell in sales. Right. And, um, and so the book is packed with, uh, with lots of useful tips. There's, you know, like I said, 57 of them. Right. So, um, but they're divided up, you know, rather than, rather than pick three out of the 57 or that are, that are the top ones. Cause it depends on the subject. Right. Um, it sort of breaks it down into like, sort of, you know, like, you know, how, what, what were the ways that I used to get in front of the customers and, and, and how, once I was there, how do I stay in front of it and how do I act when I'm there? Right. And so mm -hmm. there's a lot in the book on, you know, um, you know, tips and techniques about getting, getting into the customer's location, getting them on the phone, things like that. So, um, you know, and then how to, how to act in front of them. So that's really broken down into things like building rapport, right? Which I spent mm -hmm. a fair bit of time on and, you know, really it's both rapport and not being, un, not being a displeasure to do, you know, don't do this, right? Don't do that, right? And also do this and do that. And uh, so it's a combination of things to do and combination of things not to do, right? And don't be annoying, et cetera, right? And some stories oh, so, of- uh, I should have read that book before uh, <laughs> <laughs> before attempting sales. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so actually that's a really great kind of framing kind of, of two, what, what are yeah. the to do's and not to do's. And one of the to do's that you, you bring up in there is use, use humor. All right. And yes, I think there's yeah. a lot of anxiety probably for people about using humor. Is this going to be appropriate humor? Um, is, you know, I think there's a, probably questions of how authentic, uh, you know, is humor to some people, right. Was kind of flat jokes versus like more conversational humor where you're just talking to a friend or, or somebody you want to help, you know, so guide us a little bit on what are, where do you find, you know, humor works best? And then, you know, any applications uh, that you've seen that, that either kind of either in the ice breaking mode or just solidifying the relationship mode uh, yeah. works best. So the, so one, one uh, at some point a long time ago, I don't remember when, and I don't remember who, but um, I learned this definition of humor being the juxtaposition of the incongruent. Right. Mm -hmm. And I mean, mm -hmm. which is really a mouthful, but really what it means is sort of like lining up two things that are incongruent in a way that it can't help, but be funny. Right. And I mean, I, I, like I'm scrambling, you know, think of something right off the top of my head right now. And, but I, it's kind of escaping me, but but oftentimes, like the, you know, just pointing out something that's sort of like just humorously sort of incompatible or whatever about something that someone. Well, I have, I have an example for you. Go you ahead. tell me if it's, yeah. a, it's a fit one. So, so uh, you know, my other head, other than the podcast I run, uh, relate to, and relate to turns your business communications, typically written or visual, into. Um, a more engaging interactive experiences. And so people typically would start like a sales proposal or sales site was kind of or, or a book 
you know, was was this sort of like, I'm really excited to share, you know, all this stuff, you know, it's super interesting, blah, blah, blah. so like some something like that sounds, you know, very, very exciting. But in reality, when you kind of imagine yourself, like reading a 80 page book without like easy to follow and something, like, I'm really excited to bore you for the next right. 54 yeah. pages of yeah. really long text. You yeah, know, it's hard to navigate and escape from, right? And sort yeah. of like that is, is that is that like a yes, kind of it is, yeah. And, because, and, yeah. Yeah, and I and so one one example that I use in the book, which is the um, well, the rule is always ask for a mini a mini tour, right? And if people are like, "What's a mini tour?" and a tour is well, uh, a tour, it's a tour that's mini, right? And basically meaning it doesn't take all freaking afternoon, and right. uh, it's like. You know, because we're selling to businesses, we're selling stuff, right? Things. I mean, I've always been in kind of in the hardware business, selling hard right. products, not software, really. You know, but nonetheless, you I have to visit the customers, and usually they're buying things because they're expanding something. You know, they're building a new building, a new lab, a new office, a new this, a new that, right? And so, I often would find I found you know early on that getting beyond the lobby and getting to the place where the products are going to be used is is critical to seeing how. How you fit in the pecking order right and so the mini tour is basically saying hey i know you're building a new lab you know can i get a quick mini tour of the lab and you know and then the guy kind of hums and haws and a little bit and it's like look don't worry it won't take long i promise i won't sell any encyclopedias while i'm in the building right and <laughs> that is kind of so how the encyclopedias I, line is like right the, the, you know yeah. and, and, and the, guy, the guy got him because it's basically he that is what he's afraid right he's worried right. that i'm going to be selling life insurance and encyclopedias throughout the building and embarrassing him or whatever it's like no i just want a quick look and in the lab and you know in and out and what have you right Right? And there's other rules that I combine with those rules that really reinforce him having made the right decision. It's not about the humor now, but I mean, that joke usually snaps them into saying, OK, fine, let's go and have a quick look at the lab or the warehouse or the office or the expansion or the new level, the new floor, the new this, the new that, whatever. And while I'm while I'm, uh, you know, on my way there, I'm practicing other rules. Right. Like never forget a face. Right. Uh -huh. Because before I showed up to meet him, of course. Yeah. I never sit in the lobby. That's the name of the book, right? So so I don't have to stand for 10 minutes waiting. If I'm a little bit early, I'm in my car. And while I'm in my car, I practice my never forget a face routine, which is where I go through my phone and I look at everyone in the building I've ever met and I re-remember their face, right? And so mm. I bring it from long-term memory, which is deep down 61 years of memory, right? Uh, and I bring it to the forefront, right? Like I remember Sally and I remember her face and I bring it to the forefront. So it's not only on the tip of my tongue, but it's really, you know, ready to be said, hey, Sally, right? That's the difference because that nanosecond or when you're old like me, you know, m several microseconds of delay, getting it from the back to the front it's already tells Sally that you you forgot her name, right? And so that is a that is a perfect example of not being a pleasure to do business with, right? You forgot my goddamn yeah, name. This is really <laughs> interesting, right? So like so so we let's let's sort of translate this, and you know we one of the, one group of our audiences are marketers, for example, right? Sure. And, and people and the and the kind of who create who create the. Uh, maybe either digital content or support sales teams. And, you know, there's really this fascinating pattern because most of marketing is typically one to many. And then there's some sort of, it starts right. going to account-based marketing, which is one to few, but it's never typically as personalized as sales experiences right. uh, and sales conversations. And so if we were to kind of do this exercise of, of trying to, you know, take the insight that you have from kind of how do you have human to human interactions and bring it to the world that's highly digital. It sounds like when I, let's say, land in a proposal document, I need to feel like there's something that's there for me. There could be my name or my group's name at a minimum where I yes. can go and jump directly. So I know, Hey, uh, I'm in the IT you right. know, security division and there's a chapter for me and I don't, I could listen to linear narrative and, you know, et cetera, but I could go directly to the parts that I care about. Is that, 
Is it Mike kind of interpreting this yeah, correctly? Yeah, you're yeah, trying to do and like when I, yes, yeah, and also like for in the marketing side of things, it would be you know we've all found ourselves getting. It feels like we're getting moved out of funnels and put back in the top where they've already met us, but they're they're maybe like they're rerunning us into a funnel and uh, like a sale, a click funnel uh, routine. Like on this is on the marketing side now, right? Where it's like, wait a minute, like you're at, you're talking to me, this email, although I can sort of sense that it's a click funnel routine. Um, you've put me in the wrong place. You already know me. I've already replied. I've already maybe joined the mail list, what, what, whatever. But why isn't your, why isn't your marketing engine smart enough to know whether I'm brand new contact, I've subscribed or unsubscribed, you know, those are things that are like easy to be um, managed these days with HubSpot and things like that. Yeah, right. If you, and, did, if you just put the tracking code right. on your HubSpot and Marketo and you download an ebook, if you know what you're doing with HubSpot or Marketo, you actually would not even have you fill out the form. As an right. example, exactly because you already know that this is a, somebody that we know. Yeah. They, they already have right. signed up. Why do I need the poor, poor customer to fill out the same form? At, right, or say you know, like I've already right. downloaded the book, and instead of saying, "Oh, I hope you enjoyed the book," because it's reusing my name later or whatever, it's like it forgot yeah. that I downloaded the book instead of asking me how I liked the book. You know, yeah. all, all those kinds of things, right? And so. And I mean, when, when they going back to the sales now, when you're in the lobby, get the mini tour, the guy says, yes, now you're walking in towards the new uh, expansion, the new floor, the new building, the new lab, whatever. And you bump into like six people and it's like, oh, Sally, Bob, John, how's it going? Oh, I haven't seen you in a while. Jack, what's, and this guy's like, holy shit, this guy knows everybody, right? Yeah, right. And everybody also says, wow, I can't believe he always remembers my name. I really like that Glenn guy. Whenever he comes, he always remembers my name. And, you know, he's such a pleasure to do business with, right? And I mean, the worst thing is when these people remember your name and you you remember their name eventually, but they've already walked past you because you're, 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 you know, you're on, a, on the move getting to this new lab with this other guy. And I mean, the guy's already 30 paces behind and you're like, oh, right, Jack. You know, I mean, it's pretty, pretty bad luck, right? And, right? and so, and also it throws off your mojo, right? In the sense, that oh I forgot his name I feel so stupid and you know and um and even in even in the non-selling environments like if I go somewhere with my wife I'm always telling her every time you say hello to someone make sure you use their name always use their name don't ever assume I know their name always repeat their name you know and because you're and gonna I help just, me out because I may not I may forget right, it, right? Yeah. yeah and it's like exactly. oh Jack you remember my husband Glenn right you know like that kind of a thing right like don't don't handicap me with expecting me to remember who that person was. Right. And, and I do the same for them. Right. I'm using the person's name. They like hearing their own name and I'm helping the people that I'm with to uh, in case they didn't read my book and practice the never forget a face rule before entering the uh, location. Right. And um, yeah. Well, that's uh, fascinating. What you're removing is sort of a kind of an uncomfortable friction around human encounters, right? And I right. think we can, I think this is really fundamental and I kind of want to come back to this because I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, me come, not coming directly from a sales universe originally. Um, when I came in and into an enterprise software organization, in my case, and I met, you know, sales leaders and sales team members, I was just blown away. There are some of the nicest, most, you know, fun, interesting people right. humans to be around and then you know but there's a sort of stereotype of like oh they're salespeople. they're kind of right you know that there's a sort of Slick, stigma fast in some part of the society right and yeah. um fundamentally i think it, certainly at a at a professional like at a professional level where it's sort of you're you're not you you don't you you're not really selling something people don't want you're just trying to identify if you could help right. people solve a problem and if if you can help, if you can't, you'll point them in another direction. Is that is that kind of that mindset of that these are just two humans talking? Is that sounds like that's sort of what you're really actually after, right? Like in, yeah, in I'm better. trying to eliminate all sources of um, see because I I I go on about attraction is not a tro a choice. And I feel mm -hmm. the same way about like rapport, right? You're either building rapport or losing rapport, right? It's like a, mm. it's like a scale, right? <laughs> uh, a continuum of where you are on the, on the rapport. Uh, and there, there's things you're going to do that are going to increase rapport. And there are things that you may do that will decrease rapport. 
And, um, and so I'm always trying to measure my behavior in a way that is, um, no, that is either, uh, Equal, like where there's equal, like it's not even increasing or decreasing it. So it's, amb they're ambivalent or it's increasing rapport. Right. And, um, you know, like for instance, I'm not going to talk about highly charged political things to customers, uh, you know, that first of all, I don't even know what their affiliations are, their beliefs. Right. And there's so many, there's so many topics today. Right. I won't ever engage in any of those things. And, um, you know, uh, those are really good examples. Um, but it's a lot of times it's things about body language and listening techniques and that are really where the subtleties of rapport are buried in. Right. And, um, you know, so like let's, not let's talk about body language. Right. So obviously there is, like things like mirroring where you're kind of full, you know, you're, you're connecting on that level. But one of the things that we find really fascinating and maybe you could provide a perspective. So we, we developed something we call digital body language. And so that is okay. uh, like, let's say I send you a proposal and I could see what you, you know, not, Hey, great. Thank you. You know, thank you, Alex. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, I'm really great. And then I never look at it. Right. right? So at first I know okay. like you've never looked at the proposal, but if you look at oh, okay. it, I can yeah, see yeah, where yeah. did you look, you know, where did you really engage? Did you actually deep dive into case study A or B? And then when I come into a meeting, I'm actually like really, um, you know, prepared to add value to, because I, I may kind of have to have an anticipation, like you may want to drill into particular areas uh, or or kind of you skip something that's really important potentially. And that sort of is, a, is actually, you know, not meant to track you, but it's actually meant to have a higher quality conversation with, with whoever kind of has consumed your content. And in the conversation that's face to face, right? Like let's say you're pitching a presentation, right? Typically it's a monologue, right? And, and you just have to get through the slides and they're in a linear way, but imagine Again, like a digital body language says, well, you pick the journey, right? Here's five, here's five solutions, you know, we're, that we prepared for you based on our early discussion. Which one do you want to drill into right now? Then this is sort of a conversation, this is a conversation that between, you know, friends almost, or any sort of normal conversation versus a monologue-like experience. So I'm curious to see is this aligned with what you're seeing the the kind of some of the best sales folks do in, in kind of when they're when they're not using any presentation tools or digital tools where they really kind of let let the customer sometimes drive the discussion um and and or like you know maybe it differs right like what's your take yeah. on the digital Well I have a important? I have yeah so when you say digital, do you mean like you're doing it virtually or you're just doing a digital presentation on like a, just, to, I just want to understand the, the boundary of the question. So are you talking about being in the boardroom and showing a digital presentation or you're doing something where it's a digital interaction over uh, electronic medium, like you're at your office, they're at their office or. Um, yeah, it could, could be I all just, of the above. So I think, I okay. think you're blurring effectively. So you yeah. could be, you could be sort of presenting and you could so, choose which direction the, the the vendor drives the presentation then they feel it's a co-created experience yeah and the so same I, could be done on zoom right like so yeah effectively okay so i think your thing is really cool i mean um i have a whole thing on presentations which is a little bit different and so um so well, I let's mean, hear I, it let's hear it mm -hmm. okay so the way i approach a presentation is I call it, uh, it's on my website and you can download the, the, the map of it or the diet, you know, like it's a, it's a booklet that shows you how to build one a presentation like this. And it's called the punch perfect pitch and close. Right. Okay. And this is the way I have reduced. Cause I've been, you know, since 1985, I've been showing up places and showing people products and hoping they're going to buy them. Right. And so I had to uh, develop a, you know, kind of a way of doing it that wasn't boring and right. um you know it doesn't put people to sleep and and so and i do actually go on about it in the book so obviously hopefully everyone reads the book of course but that's a mm -hmm. shameless plug but um but nonetheless the punch perfect pitch and close is basically the idea that 
most people sort of, sorry, most people, when they start their presentation, they kind of like throw up the PowerPoint and they start with like the factory in, uh, you know, in North Carolina or Los Angeles. And this is our yeah, factory. About us. This is about 300 me, people. Me. And yeah, we were founded yeah. in 1973 by the Forster brothers and, yeah. you know, sold yeah. the company to private equity in 1981. And everyone's yeah. already asleep, right? You're done. Right. And yeah. that's not how I do it. I try to like, I start with the punch, right? And the uh -huh. punch is something that will alter their state, right? So it's either a noise, a loud noise, b banging the table, you know, the, um, you know, so you could, you know, bang the table and say, you know, I heard your finances are a problem. I heard your logistics are a problem. I heard your production's a problem. I heard, you know, I heard you're struggling for throughput. I heard, you know, whatever your business you're in, right? Mm -hmm. um, or, you you presuppose having because having qualified them why what you're there to present really what the solution is and so you, maybe you have a video which shows a customer a generic customer enjoying the benefits of the same problem that they have right like maybe they don't their throughput is a problem they can't pack goods fast enough they can't make them fast enough they can't ship them fast enough whatever right and you show your whatever it is you do your system, your software, your product, your, your machine, your, you know, your instrument, whatever mm -hmm. it is showing, solving that problem already with a dynamic, you know, uh, sort of either, um, uh, what do you call it? Like a narration or uh, with, with music and just grab their state. Right. Do you want to so, grab senses? So what you're creating yeah. is you're creating a multi-sensory yes. experience that interrupts them out of their, like, uh, out of their know, lethargy and all oh, here, another boring yeah. presentation. Yeah. How long is this yeah. going to be? I got to go. Wife's right. bitching at me, and you know, right. whatever, right? I mean, you want to you want to change their state by hitting the with the punch, right? And so, then, so, have, so Glenn, you don't yeah. know it, but you're a brother from from another mother for me. You know, slightly <laughs> older brother, I think. But uh, but uh, but I think this is fundamentally what you know why you want to go away from a, like a static. Mm -hmm. experience right because static is a it's kind of what you expect and you've seen this for the last 20 years and it hasn't changed right. that much and, and so kind of like where can the video move this like like can right. it move like can the sound move it in your case right yeah can a, can a combination would can a story of a customer that's exactly like me you know interrupt that this is not relevant and like make it hyper relevant so then i want to yeah. understand is that like am I, is yeah so that's okay great so you actually have developed a and you're doing what what are, are you are you doing this with your hands you have physically you took so, yourself so hardware so, so, the, so the chat yeah right? so so oftentimes um the uh you know it's it's anywhere from me making a like making a noise and a bold claim or to, I love the one where I can, where I can purpose a, a, a short video clip with a proper audio uh, mm -hmm. overlay on it. Right. Very short, not, you know, not a company video. Right. I'm right. Right. No, that. this is a customer uh, saying, yeah. you know, and it's like maybe 30 it. seconds and um, you know, the, um, and, and just to ch basically the, my whole intention though, is really just to change their state to get them into the present moment of being with me to learn about what I'm talking about and not worrying about the last meeting where they were getting yelled at about being over budget or below target or missing their production goals or what, you know, whatever. Right. I mean, cause people come into these meetings with, uh, you know, with emotions that have been building up for whatever amount of the day has gone by and whether they do or don't want to be there and you know, all that sort of stuff. Right. So punch is to change their state. Then it's the perfect pitch, right? So the perfect pitch and again, I, I, there's a whole guidebook that shows how I build it with the, some points and bullets and things. But basically, it uses my rule called the power of three, right? Mm -hmm. Where I present everything in the power of three. If I can't, if I can't break it into three, if I only have two, then I, then I have to elaborate my idea to get to three. And if I have four, it's too many, and I have right. to break it down into smaller chunks, or I have to break the groups up so I can present each one of them in the in the proper light, right? Mm -hmm. Like I don't want to cover too much ground with... because basically humans can hold anywhere between three to seven ideas. Once you had five, it's problematic. Right. Then, but the, you know, but like the whole idea of magic. Yeah. Three mm -hmm. is the magic Goldilocks principle. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Um, just like the golden ratios and other things, yeah. they just, they just, they just work. Right. I mean, they're just sort of mathematical uh, and just sort of human nature things that people um, kind of 
And so they like, you know, um, you know, small, medium, large, you know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah. it's like, it's the Goldilocks thing, right? Uh, too cold, too hot, just right. You know, that kind of a thing. Right. And, um, and so then, I, so I break it up into three, um, you know, topics. I also in presenting it, I, I, I use the power of three. So I tell them what I'm going to tell them. I tell them and then I tell them yeah. what I told them. While I'm right. telling them, I'm telling them three things. I'm breaking it up into three things that, and by the end of it, I've shown that our solution by the punch and then the, the three, the power of three that I've shown them, I've shown them that our solution does the job. And then the close is, well, you know, when the close is done properly, because at the end, the customer says, well, what, how do I buy your product? How much does it right? cost? Yeah. And yeah. how much does it What's cost? The What's yeah, the right exactly. that you recommend? Yeah, right, exactly. exactly. Mm -hmm. And so, and if they're not at that mode, you kind of did something wrong and you probably need to start over because you're probably not going to move the needle there if they're, if they're ambivalent. Right. And I mean, and, and there, I have other rules as well, which is important to understand that the, we, I don't always win the business because there's many, many things in play. Right. And one of them is often, you know, there's a preference for a vendor, right. There might be a preferred major purchase agreement where they get a discount or they get, you know, uh, we're Canadian. Right. So we always talk about Canadian tire money, right. Where if you buy Canadian tire, you know, you get money back. Right. And uh, you select the, you save the Canadian tire money and then you go buy useless stuff at the uh, hardware store that you don't need. Right. But, um, but I mean, maybe they have that in play with the other vendor and you don't have that with them, right. You don't have an MPA with them or something. And so, so the other rules, even what, after I've done my presentations and stuff, and if I can't close them or they're not closing themselves, then one of the other things important to mention now is that I'd rather be last than second. Right. So what I'm trying to always do is figure out, where I am in the pecking order of getting the business. And the moment I figure out that I can't win the business, then I stop selling and I move on and I go and find the next customer before the guy who is winning has a chance to beat me there. So I can be the preferred vendor on the next deal because being second is the most expensive loss that you'll have because mm. you almost win, but you get nothing, right? You probably expended more than the winning vendor did and you mm. got nothing. So mm. a lot of times what people would do is they'll fly people in from the factory or they'll take you to the main head office. Let us take you to head office and wine and dine you and go for a steak dinner and blah, blah, blah. You're still not getting the business, right? And, and so the sooner you realize that you categorically can't win, you need to graciously extract your resources and move them onto a new file. You're not rude. You don't pack up your stuff and walk out. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is you don't say, oh, like, oh, I can see you're not really sold. Let us, you know, get a trial unit and, uh, you know, something like that. Not to say you don't use trial units, but you only use trial units up to the point where you know you're still in the game, right? When you deliver the trial unit, let's say, and you find out there's nine of your competitors' units running at full speed up right beside you, you're not getting the order. <laughs> right. You know, so you're still uh, wasting your research. So I think what, what I'm hearing, and, and this is really helpful for folks like me to hear who are, you know, in the digital world where sometimes the, the incremental cost does have a human right. component, but doesn't have a physical hardware component. Um, you have these very, so the cost of losing for you is actually much higher because you yes. have to you know, because of the nature of the product, you need to go see the tour of the factory right. or the tour of the location. So it's really, really important for you to know, are these people for real? Are they yeah. interested in you? Or you call them B or C or D, exactly. right? And you want to avoid yeah. the B, C and D at all costs, because this is a reputational impact, right. time impact, yeah. you trial unit impact, right? So, so you yeah. should really be, and so what are the, what are these signs, right? Like that somebody well, who's not like in, in I will tell you like that, they're but they're not into I do, you, right? Yeah. I, I just want to tell you the second half of the, I'd rather be last than second. Yeah. Um, which is important, especially for younger people that, so, you know, you may find, Hey, you know, you quit your job to go into sales. You heard you could make good money and you get this company and you're out with this business and you know, you're a month or two in and you realize, Hey, I'm selling the number three or the number four brand, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, like 80% of the time they're buying brand a 80% of the rest of the time they're buying brand B and I'm competing for the last 4% of business with brand C and D right. Mm -hmm. And no matter how I put lipstick on a pig, I'm selling brand C or brand D, 
which means I'm only going to be able to compete on 4% of the business. And my time, the last time I checked, is just as valuable as the guy who sells brand A and brand B, yeah. right? And so I recommend to those young people, quit as soon as possible, right? Mm. Like if you're going to go into sales, you need to like be, you know, you need to be planning your career trajectory in a way that is like, you know, cognizant that every minute in your life counts, right? And if you're wasting time selling crappy brands, right, then you will be less successful than the better. So, so use those few months to hone your skills and trade up, right? Yeah. And get to the better and the biggest and the best companies and always sell the best products you can possibly sell. Because the reality is that oftentimes it's it's a, above and beyond the salesperson's capability. You know, if you're selling a subclass brand, you're just not going to get the business, even if you're the best sales guy in town. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, right? and I think this is really important for salespeople to really understand the nature of the, the company and the business. Because any company, right, and you're the CEO and founder of, of your business before you sold it, right? Yeah. You have a you have a choice, right? You could reposition your business, right, to a different subsegment of customers, as an example, right. where you are going to be A, but in another segment, you're going to be D. Exactly. Right? And that that's sort of where like sales and marketing and go-to-market really need to come together. Right. Because if you're getting feedback from sales team, right? And let's say competent sales team that hey, we're just we're coming up on these deals. We're coming in too late. We're not the preferred choice, yada, yada, yada. But then there's a pocket that you know is working, right? And right. then the, kind of the question is like, let's find that pocket. Let's find pocket number two. Let's expand that. And that's where, that sounds like that's sort of a combination of go yes. to market yeah. with sales, right? And so th is that the answer for a lot of your yes. clients that are kind of thinking yeah. through? Okay. Yeah. And another good story that I like to tell is like the chapter on the reverse Midas touch, right? Which is where everything you touch turns to shit, right? Versus gold, right? Midas touch is everything you touch turns to gold. And what happens with entrepreneurs is that they start a business and they become successful, right? Like, let's say you're selling nuts and bolts and all of a sudden you become the number one nuts and bolts sales company uh, supplier in the tri-state area, right? And if it's nuts and it's bolts, you're getting most of the business, right? And all of a sudden you decide, well, hey, you know what? Uh, there's a lot of nuts and bolts in uh, in uh, uh, trailers, that utility trailers that are customers. So let's, uh, let's start a division making trailers, right? So we can mm. sell them their bolts and then they can go around the side and pick up their trailer. And now we can get their trailer business. And mm. the thing is, is that, you know, you're a savant at running a nuts and bolts business and you spend 97% of your time running that business and it still makes lots of money and you send, start sending profits over to the trailer division where you're spending 3% of your time and there's no god-given right that 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 trailer business is just going to magically be successful because you're successful at nuts and bolts but yeah. your brain tells you that you deserve it right yeah. and you often spread yourself too thin and you find that you're taking the profits from the good stuff and spending it on the on the on the unprofitable stuff, and it takes a while for reality to sink in, and so and you know, and so you have to be really careful about how you invest your time and your money in a as an entrepreneur, thinking, well, I'm perfect at settling nuts and bowls, so whatever I touch is going to turn to gold. It doesn't work that way. So, so if we kind of wrap up on kind of core takeaways that you wish you could have told your, like, this is one of them, but your younger self, right? As, as you're uh, starting out in kind of as a leader, as a sales leader, what would, what would you say, you know, other than picking the right, the, the right engine to attach yeah. yourself to, what, what would be the, the advice that you have for folks? So, so one thing is like the the money is good, great, and it's a it's a nice little uh, scorecard, right? But it will never fundamentally change your your state of being. I have a good chapter on being miserable in the book, and I highly recommend people read it. 
and uh, have your miserability index is what I call it. And money will not change your level of miserable or happiness ever. And as a matter of fact, the more money you get, especially when you sell a business, your life becomes more complicated, right? How do mm. I keep the money? What do I do with the money? How do I not lose the money? I mean, now I don't have the business anymore. So if I screw it up, I'm dead. And, you know, like there's just so many things, right? Um, so the money will never change you. I always think about the money sort of as a scorecard that you're, you know, as an indic indication of how well you're doing, just like, you know, you're when you're running a race or, you know, you're, you know, doing a racing miles or whatever, how fast per mile do you go? go and you want to improve it it's the same thing about your earning and things like that the money in and of itself will never change you and the really clamoring for it is actually more fun than actually just getting it because once you get it and you've got it it's yeah. it's anticlimactic human right? nature so, is that yeah, we kind of it's get really bizarre we have yeah. Exactly. So it's enjoying the journey is what i'm hearing enjoying the journey enjoying, absolutely enjoying the journey yeah enjoying and you know, one of the things I love about podcasts is that we get a chance to to talk to people like yourself. And I'm enjoying right. the fact that I'm learning from you know, from what you've gone through. Um, yeah. And so, yeah. what would be your kind of reversing to that for yeah. for an entrepreneur um, that is you know really looking to capture the nuggets like the ones that you've shared with us and build it into into something that's a bit more scalable, right? Like, so whether it's a system, like you've, you've written a book, right? With some, yeah. some tips, right? And like, but what we really want is to create the types of, in our case, communication workflows that help salespeople kind of apply best practices, right? And and do it in a way where it's not coming from, you know, the, I'm the CXO and I'm telling you to do this, right. or I'm the CRM administrator and I'm telling you to do this. Well, how do you kind of shift kind of shift the minds of the sales team and their behaviors in a way that's pleasant, right? In a way that is, you know, motivates them to pull versus you pushing, pushing, pushing on on, on them. Yeah. So I find like it's more general principles that really end up being the winning. Um, like, you know, you could put in the, uh, you know, like I'm just making this up, you know, the power sales plan uh, for sales team to try to motivate them or whatever. And all those things are sure. There might be one's better than the other one's five-star rated sales program or the other, but really what the salespeople want is to follow the vision uh, of a leader of leaders that actually know what the hell they're doing. <laughs> Okay. And, and walk the walk and talk the talk, right? And so what they want to know is what's the plan, right? What is the vision for the company that I work for? How am I going to, you know, how, how am I going to benefit from working with this company? And how are my customers going to benefit from working with me? They want a clear cut path to those kinds of visions and stuff. And, you know, uh, working with a set of uh, very well-defined and uh, enforced core values, right? Hire, fire, motivate, train, reward, et cetera, on the core values. The, and seeing the leaders do that, right? Hey, this guy's a superstar salesman, but he doesn't meet the core values. He's dishonest. He's this, that, whatever. I'm sorry, you're not the right fit. We're letting you go, right? And um, they want to see you doing those kinds of things. Um the biggest thing about is, you know, they want to follow leaders that can lead, right? And I always caution uh, entrepreneurs that when you're in that position of being a leader, then your your real job is not actually to be the best in every one of your departments, finance, marketing, sales, mm. shipping, receiving, finance, logistics. You know, that's not your job as the entrepreneur to know it all and be all super smart and all of it. Your job is to make the decisions for the team that you hire and mm. make proper, timely decisions especially under stressful conditions, right? And so, and to hold frame. And so when people say, Hey, look, you know, the, you know, the price of containers gone from 5,000 uh, per container to ship from China to Canada from to $25,000, what are we going to do? Right? Like the, they need answers, right? And you have to give them decisions and make decisions for the business. And, and if you can, if you can present yourself as someone that can make decisions and and follow and uh, and lead, then people will naturally follow you, including the sales team. And really, most people want to follow a good leader, right? And, right. and so, if you're in that position of leadership, then lead. You know, don't don't think you have to work harder than anyone else. You you need to make decisions and and you need to show leadership to the team. And the final thing I want to say is that the 
you know, people say this all the time because it's true, right? It's really the people that you hire into your business that will govern whether you're successful or not. And every one of them is so vitally important that, you know, you want to hire really, really, really slowly and you want to fire super fast. The moment someone's not working out, fire them. You're doing your both a favor. There's no you know, performance improvement plans, all that stuff. No. The moment that you realize, even if it's the first hour that they're working there, you're fired. I'm sorry we're doing us both a favor. And be very slow to hire, right? And don't like, oh, well, you know, my cousin's nephew, you know, he he, he studied web design in grade seven. So maybe we can get him to work on the website. No, 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 you're not doing that. Like, you need to hire the absolute best possible person that you can afford in every role at every step. And if you've done it perfectly as an entrepreneur, your job will be nothing. You'll have no job to do because every one of your departments will be perfectly led by a perfect and leader. more competent in that than you. That uh, than you. And all yeah. you need to do is give them the decisions that they need to do their job. You know, can we spend $50,000 on a new software system? Can we buy a new packing machine for $100,000? You know, we're having trouble with this. What do we do? You know, the yeah. bank, you know, blah, 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 whatever, right? You need to make those decisions and show the vision for the company and the leadership and, and decision-making. And that's really w- what an entrepreneur needs to do. And, um, and Amazing the success. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. We've learned about, you know, hand-to-hand sales engagements and kind of how to do them as humans versus kind of playing roles. We've right. learned a ton about um, leadership and and also just thinking about how do you build the type of organization that helps people succeed inside that organizations for values. So thank you so much You're for welcome. covering these topics. Glenn, where can people find you? Basically go to glennpoulis.com and you can link to all my LinkedIn and everywhere else from there. And uh, if they want to get a hold of me specifically, LinkedIn's the best spot really active on there. They can connect with me and uh, send me a message and happy to talk to anybody that wants to uh, discuss anything. Amazing. Thank you so much, Glenn. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Alex. Thanks for having me.